plant medicine is a big part of my life. Um, but even before that, I w- was interested in Buddhism. I remember when I was just in high school and just started reading books and trying to get an understanding of what's going on. And then I took my first mushroom trip with a group of friends when I was 18. And then that changed everything, of course. It was, I mean, it was the perfect dose. I didn't take too much. I didn't take too little. That it expanded my consciousness, you know, over a course of a few hours. And I came to understand a lot more about myself in the world in those few hours than I had. It almost felt like to my, my whole life to that point. What's up, everybody? We are back with another episode of Sugar and Snakes Takes. And today we have a very special guest. And I got to read off everything she accomplished because she's accomplished so much. Uh, She's two-time Olympic alternate in women's freestyle, uh, multi-national champion, three-time Pan American champion, two-time world champion, team member, two-time junior world champion, currently fighting MMA at Adam Waite. Uh, she's a judo black belt and um, she's a psycho spiritual coach and she's so much more. The words that just came out of my mouth can truly embody everything that this person this is. This is Victoria Anthony, a very sweet person, a wonderful person. Uh, thank you for being on. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Now, um, I mean... You're one of my favorite wrestlers when it comes to the inside trip, like watching you do your thing with the inside trip, watching you wrestle. uh, For me, it really raised my understanding of of just like of women wrestling in general. You know what I'm saying? Like you ever watch somebody wrestle? And and, and as a man, like you, I watch you wrestle and it's like, I'm not watching a woman wrestle. It goes beyond classifying and gender, if that makes any sense. You know what I'm saying? Your technique is that good. You're just that flawless. And, and that's a compliment, no shade to you at all. But I want to just kind of, you know, take you back from the beginning of how it all started. Like, how did you be in such a beautiful, talented, <laughs> petite woman become such a badass on a mat? <laughs> yes. Thank you for the kind words. So I started with judo. Thank God, because judo made my style what it is. Um, I'm so grateful for that sport. And I started when I was six and it was really just like, I'm a hyperactive person. I always have been since I was a little kid and I would have to go watch my dad practice. And I just wanted to be like him. And I love martial arts from a young age. I would watch martial arts movies and I just wanted to be like everybody in the movies. So I would go watch judo practices. And I was like, I want, I want to do this if I have to come every day and sit and watch this. So from six to 14 was judo. And that's really like the basis of my style of trips, throws, sweeps and I love that sport so much. It taught me so much and it, it taught me how to be a martial artist as well. And, and then 14, I, or at 13, I broke my wrist in judo, judo nationals. And I really was tracking for the Olympic team in judo. That was my, when I figured out what the highest level of the sport was, I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. And then um, my wrist snapped. I had to have three surgeries in the same year when I was 13. And then I went into high school. And my parents had suggested I start wrestling because I was just sitting around and I'd been an athlete. And like I said, I was hyperactive. So I was driving my mom crazy. <laughs> She's like, she needs to do something. She can't just sit here. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not going to join the boys wrestling team. <laughs> That's like social suicide at the school. I'm not going to fit in on the boys wrestling team. And I'm not going to fit in at the school so, anymore. So let me ask you. So like, were you like tomboyish or were you like a girly girl who just, just like who was just physical like that? I, I think I was somewhere in between. Like, I wasn't really okay. a tomboy. I, yeah. I wanted to step into femininity so bad, but I had, like, a like a, like a crazy martial artist inside me, too. So it was always yeah. confusing. Like, I want to be like these girls. But I also would – I remember that there was the only time I really got in trouble in elementary school was for, like, fighting with the boys back behind – the portables because <laughs> there was like this like chaos that would ensue every day at recess and I was the only one that kind of actually knew how to fight they're just whatever and I could do judo obviously so yeah um, yeah always a so you so you were beating up all the boys I did yeah <laughs> 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 and then I was like oh my god what a date I remember I won up the pull up contest in elementary school and I was like I'm so confused <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, so, so you, you got in, you got into judo. Were you, other, were you athletic in any other ways? I mean, cause I've watched you and been around you and like the way you bounce and you're very light, very, 
area in your your movements obviously judo taught you a lot and wrestling has taught you body control but were there any other sports that lent uh you know some some you know learnings to your to mm -hmm. where you are right now no i was terribly unathletic in every other sport <laughs> like anything that with a ball <laughs> or a bat or any other device involved i i still can't do them and i didn't couldn't at the time when i was younger um i tried out <laughs> I, tried volleyball and school, I tried track and i was like i this isn't for me <laughs> That's awesome. So, so the battles behind the the battles behind the portables were those just uh, challenges by the boys to you, or did you just go back there and find them scrapping and start saying, "Hey, let's go"? Yeah, I found them. I was like, "Oh, every day at recess, these boys just come fight." So I got involved, and I could throw like I'm, I. <laughs> Taitoshi, like Uchimata, but so these boys are like flying and someone didn't like it. So they told on me. I was the only one that got told on. <laughs> <laughs> Any of your other like girlfriends go with you? Any, anybody else? Or is it just you with a no, bunch of boys? No, it was just me. Yeah, if my memory serves correctly. Uh -huh. That's hilarious. Yeah. So, so, around, so after that, after your arm broke with judo, then you decided to get in wrestling and then wrestling just took off from there? Yeah, exactly. So I saw, I was in PE class in freshman year PE. And that my eventual high school coach was doing demonstrations to try to pull kids from PE and recruit kids to the wrestling team. Yeah. And wrestling was not a cool sport at my school. That was another reason I didn't want to join. I was like, nobody really wants to join the wrestling team here. Um, but I saw the demonstration and I was like, okay, this looks a lot like judo and I absolutely hate PE and I can't play any other sports. So I guess I'm going to try wrestling. And it still took me, I remember it took me two weeks to even walk into the wrestling room, even though I decided just because I was so resistant to this thing that I knew I wanted to do, like it was in my heart. But um, yeah, I had a lot of resistance, like I, socially, I suppose. Now I, got, now I got to ask you, I mean, listen, I mean, wrestling is probably one of the hardest sports in the world. Like I've tried to quit wrestling so many times in high school, but my coach wouldn't let me. Uh <laughs> Why did you choose to wrestle over just doing PE? Like PE, PE would seem to me like it'd be the easier choice to like, you know what I'm saying? Versus. Yeah, I, uh -huh. I think it comes back to how I'm built. Like I need enough yeah. stimulus in life to keep me engaged in life. Otherwise I would just like uh, be done with it. And I honestly yeah. think that's what kept me en engaged in wrestling too. Cause people are like, did you just fall in love with it? I'm like, not really. Like you said, it's one of the hardest things you could choose to do. And I just remember every single day, freshman year, going into the wrestling room, going on these runs with the boys, like not being that good of a runner, we're running three to five miles. Then you go in the wrestling room two hours and I don't know what I'm doing. I can throw, but I don't know how to wrestle. And uh, just, I remember feeling uncomfortable every single day, <laughs> but I think it's the type of person that I am that yeah. I attack something like that. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep trying to figure this out, even though this kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. So what, when, what was that turning point like that? Because for you, I mean, I don't imagine you had many, uh, like, were you wrestling girls or were you wrestling boys? Because I know at a certain weight, you know, it, it's it's quite competitive, like at 96 pounds and like 105 right. pounds, it can be quite competitive between a girl and a boy. But like, were you wrestling girls or were you wrestling boys? And how much did you yeah. actually get to wrestle? Yeah, I wrestled... Uh, by my sophomore year, I was wrestling boys varsity at 103. Oh, wow. So yeah, and that was really my focus was the boys season. And I'm really grateful. So they, I'm grateful for both of the things that happened. So they, women's high school wrestling was not sanctioned in California when I wrestled. So my only option was to wrestle boys. And then they had unsanctioned girls state and girls wrestling tournaments throughout the state. But we'd have to drive really far to find uh, these competitions and whatever. Um, but now it's sanctioned. So I don't think I would even have been allowed to wrestle on the boys team. But that, that really shaped me into who I am today, and it shaped my wrestling over those three years, four years. Um, so in California, there's Boys League, then it goes CIF, then uh, Masters in State. So I'm the only, I've won league three times in the boys division, and then I'm the only girl that's ever won Boys CIF Masters in Southern wow. Section. And, or sorry, excuse me, I said that wrong. <laughs> boys, boys CIF, and then I made it to Masters twice, but never made it through to State. Wow, that's, that's pretty much, dope, man, because California is probably one of the hardest states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. How much did you lean on the, what you le learned in judo? I mean, I'm sure, like, my experience in wrestling was seventh grade only, and we worked out so hard. It was so wrestling hard. was simple. I'd go out and wrestle, and it'd be like two minutes. I'd pin the kid, and then would oh, be God. done. But we'd train yeah, all day for, like, working. hours yeah, and hours of just endless. Oh, God, the, the training was just killer. Um, how much did you lean or what did you learn in judo that was able to trans transpire onto the, the mat to get you through those tough times? 
Yeah, to be honest, my judo is what carried me through those those boys' matches on the varsity level. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember my to make it to Masters my sophomore year, it went into overtime. It was like so dramatic because the only the top five make it to Masters and it was for fifth place. And uh, it goes into overtime and I just relied on judo and end up throwing the kid um, to make it to Masters. So that's how my, my career has been and my style is from judo is like these dramatic throws and finishes. But I, I definitely over relied on judo. And I, th- I did that into my senior career as well, because you can get yourself out of position um, going to, to sweep or to trip or do these different things. But it was the basis of my technique mm-hmm. that allowed mm. me to compete at that level. So like I know for me, like there was always that moment where I, I still remember that moment where it was me stepping into being a serious wrestler. Like I was always a slacker before that, but then once I realized I can be good and I had that one tournament where I just showed out, I was like, oh, I can be that guy. What was that for you where you was like, you know what, I've arrived, Um, I'm as good as I think I am, if not even better? Right. I think that for me, it was always, I, I always just set my sights on whatever the highest level of this thing is. So from the beginning, I I just was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to figure out how to get to the highest level of it. Um, but I do think actually belief in, in my capacity to be that girl mm-hmm. was something I struggled with throughout my whole career. And I would, I would like one common um, situation for me is making it to the finals and then losing in the, losing in the finals. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I really, really, really struggled with and what wrestling helped me grow within myself, um, even though I honestly didn't accomplish my actual, my highest goal in wrestling, which was to be Olympic champion. I've been the Olympic alternate twice, didn't make the team. But now the person that I am because of that is a person that I do have the belief that I can do anything in life. And now in MMA, I, I believe I can do anything in MMA. Um, and that's because of how wrestling shaped and molded me. And mm-hmm. it forced me to confront that part of myself that didn't believe I was worthy of the highest level of my sport. I love that. So the, the <laughs> listeners here, if you don't know Victoria, she she's she looks like she's the same size as me and Rashad. But <laughs> she she's pretty petite and and just a total badass. Like I said, yeah. floats around. Um, Pure muscle. I'm sure that had mm-hmm. yeah. I'm yeah, sure that had that like some effect. <laughs> we're all both the same. Were, all three of us. <laughs> yeah, everybody's yeah, built like you, that. We're all both the same. My mom doesn't work out with me. Kind of like she's like like stocky and strong looking. <laughs> Dang. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you you are you are a little ball muscle, and I you know I just have to think you know when you when you stepped on the mat at certain times I'm sure people you know the worst thing you can do in wrestling is judge a book by its cover of course, um, mm-hmm. and you're wrestling you know probably not people your height but maybe your your weight. Um, is there any interesting like stories of of you know stepping on the mat with someone and you know obviously maybe you thought you could take them or you knew they were like oh look at this girl i'm gonna whoop her uh any stories like that you can remember the one thing that's coming to mind there's a woman named irene merlini and she's the first olympic champion in women's wrestling and i wrestled her in you she's ukrainian and i wrestled her in the ukraine <laughs> tournament and this is when i was really young do you know who she is rashad no, that's a great name, though. I'm like, I really oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such an interesting character. But I step on the mat, and I'm young. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I was like 19 at the time, or I'm really just getting in, involved in international senior level wrestling. And she like slaps both her thighs and starts growling. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> I just remember being confused. And later, a woman, and I ended up losing the match. I mean, she was like levels above me i believe i scored on her but she was levels above me at the time but i get off the mat and later i talked to a woman named clarissa chun who's a multi-time olympian for the u.s and olympic bronze medalist and she's she t- tells me like oh yeah she she does this she tries to intimidate people especially like you're a young athlete and i was like okay i did, I wasn't intimidated i was just confused confused so it didn't, <laughs> yeah. it didn't work it didn't work like, then <laughs> okay no <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, wrestling on the international level has got to be something else because you have these people from that region over there, that, that that Russian, that European region over there, where they're just tough as nails and they wrestle at a at a, just a different level. Um, what was it like competing over there? For me, specifically, Russia is my favorite place in the world to wrestle um, because I find that they 
just love the sport of wrestling so much. Like yeah. women in the U.S. are still trying to fight to even be able to wrestle. <laughs> um, and I don't know if there's places like that. I'm sure there are. There's places like Dagestan, whatever. But but for the places that I competed, like there's a, a tournament in Siberia every January. So it's the dead of winter in Siberia. <laughs> and I've been there five times, competed there five times. And it's the coldest place I've ever been. You walk outside, your eyelashes start to freeze. But it's my favorite, one of my favorite places in the world and my favorite competition because from the very first rounds, you know, it's not it's not the quarterfinals or even semifinals. The stands are full and they see in action like a just a good maneuver. So if I inside trip someone in the first round, the whole crowd is clapping. Nuts. And I remember the first time. Yeah. And because you go like U.S. Nationals, the first round. I mean, it's people's parents. It's not like it's not the same thing. It's not. The, it's never given yeah. me the same feeling. The first time. Yeah. The first round of this tournament, I was like, <gasps> For me, <laughs> like, wow. thank you so much. And it just gave me um, so much like passion for what I was doing. And I was like, wow, mm. to be appreciated in this way, just purely as for the, for the sake of the, the technical aspect of my sport, which is the part that I like so much. Um, yeah. It's such a it's such a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Now you talk about like women, um, you know, not being too prevalent in wrestling. I feel like now there's a whole shift that's changing. Like I'm hearing more about there's more rest of women's wrestling team, uh, women's wrestling teams in high schools and things like that. And women going out for the wrestling team more on a, uh, on a consistent basis. Do you, do you think, or how much I should say, how much do you attribute that, that growth in women going to wrestling to do with MMA? Oh, Interesting question. That's a good question. Uh, I was I, my assumption is that it plays a role. It plays a factor. Yeah. But at the same time, there's so many girls that I know. So many of the girls that are in my generation currently, nobody wants to fight. And I'm like, mm. you fight. Like I've seen you fight before. Yeah. But they don't want to step into a cage. Mm-hmm. But maybe from the you know the perspective of a visual aspect to bring girls up and through the ranks, I'm sure that it plays a role. Um, yeah. I think largely it's attributed to women's wrestling being sanctioned now in in each state so uh, 45 states have women's wrestling at the high school level so that's changed everything like in california it's exploded it's the fastest growing high school sport in our nation um yeah. but i remember I did a clinic at a i did a clinic like i don't know five years ago at this high school and then i went back in the last couple of years and they had a separate boys and girls high school wrestling room I was like, that's crazy. I could never have imagined that when I was in high school, you know. Uh, What's been some of the things for you as as uh, the brutal sport that it is? I mean, not brutal, but just can be brutal and, and staying in shape and working through injuries like you are right now. Um, what's some of your, you know, like secret sauce, some things you do to to stay in shape, to – to get the right kind of rest, to recover, to perform? What, what are some things you do? Because I remember seeing one thing where you talked about taping your mouth shut at oh, yeah. night to work on breathing. And I'm like, that sounds like prison to me. Like, oh, God, no <laughs> that way. Was, that's a good thing to bring up. That was one of the best things I ever learned to do for myself. Um, wow. I worked with a company called NeuroForce One. Henry was trained by them. Like a bunch of UFC fighters go through their program. And I remember Andre, the the lead trainer there, just told me try to mouth or try to um, nasal breathe for these airdyne sprints. And like I said, I just want to if if there's something to figure out, if there's a better way or a higher way to do it, I'm like, well, if you're telling me to nasal breathe right now, right now, should I do it all the time? He's like, yeah, but that's gonna be hard. And then but then he did tell me about mouth taping, and they they tape us on the bikes. Um, so since then, since that conversation with him, I trained myself to only breathe through my nose. Like truly, it's you'll rarely see me huffing air through my mouth. Um, and that's changed a lot because it just brings we we over oxygenate our bodies by sucking air in through our mouths. And then it doesn't it doesn't help our system. It hurts us. So learning to nasal breathe has been a huge one and just kind of always keeping my my nervous system in check during harder training. And what else? My diet and honestly, just like the basic things that are so somehow so hard for me anyway, is like a consistent sleep regimen. Um, not over consuming caffeine or stimulants, but the type of person I am too, like we, we talked a little bit before the show, I like the feeling of being hyped up on caffeine, <laughs> but that turns into a vicious cycle. So at my age of 32, I'm finally getting these things under control. Um, and <laughs> like honestly, it's taken a long time <laughs> just yeah. to get into a good sleep routine and be strict with myself with that. I think some people don't have to do it, do it so strictly. Like some people, I don't know how you guys are. Are you good at just literally falling asleep when you get into your bed? 
Yeah, yeah I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, can shut it down. Like, I feel like at a, by a certain point in the night, if I don't slow down and get myself to bed and like really, really like take my time to get to sleep, I'm going to be up till two in the morning just because my brain turns on. It's Keep like, going. what are we doing right now? You got to yeah. listen to Rashad's uh, meditation. Yeah, you got to yeah. listen to that, that breathing that you're talking about. I, I learned this breathing exercise from this breathing coach named uh, Brian Mirabella. And uh, he would talk about taping your mouth shut and sleeping like that and actually doing sprints with your mm -hmm. mouth shut and everything and just all through your nose and nasal breathing. But it does, it, it's it's crazy how it calms your body when you breathe through your nose. Like it just, it, it, cre it, it, you can be doing something so strenuous, but when you start breathing through your nose, it calms your body down and you find like this homeostasis at a very high level where you just can keep on going and going. It's almost like catching that, like being in a zone type thing. Yes, agree. Yeah, it's like we have feedback, feedback loops going in both directions. I can try to use my brain to tell my body to calm down, or I can use my body and nasal breathing to calm my brain down and just bring my body back into, like bring everything into alignment. Yeah. Um, it took a while for me to be able to do it all the time, but it was well worth investing the effort to, to nasal breathe. Yeah, that's awesome. So you, you've, you've made the transition from wrestling at the highest level uh, now to MMA. First question is, what was it like to make that transition? Like, how was it to say goodbye to wrestling? And what is it like to now step into this world of MMA and how much of, I mean, you're, you're a student of the game and we've had our conversations uh, many times and I can just tell that you're just a sponge and you soak up information so fast and, you, and you've, you know, you've gotten good so fast. So, uh, like, what has it been like? Yeah, it's been an interesting journey. So the the start of MMA for me was very similar to the start of wrestling for me in that I was really resistant to it, but I felt something inside me that's like, go do this. <laughs> but I didn't want to. I was like, this is crazy. They're getting elbowed in the face. I already, one of the most annoying things for me in wrestling is getting my face scratched up because I scar really easily. So I'm like, I already have all these scratches. I don't want to get my face literally split open by people's elbows. Like I'm not doing that. And then there was a series of events that showed me like, this is for you. Um, I remember when I went to one MMA practice and was, and I haven't done any MMA yet, but I was going with the girl my weight and it just clicked into my brain like, oh, this girl cannot get up from underneath me unless I let her up because of the degree of wrestling that I have. And I don't know if I just had that situation with that girl that day to kind of show me and click it into place, but it, I just started to understand the value of wrestling in this sport. Um, and really understanding, because one of the things, like, I don't I don't know how to strike. How long is it going to take me to figure this out? But then once I started to practice striking and practice jujitsu, falling in love with the, the aspects of these sports that I don't know, and it's that thing inside me that wants to figure it out and wants to get better and keeps pulling me back in that way. Um, but one thing I didn't really do was take a break after wrestling for, I mean, I wrestled from 14 to 32, and before that I competed in judo from 6 to 14. So basically 25 years straight of competitive sport, aside from that one year where I was injured. Um, but from that point, and then I was really, I was still a kid at that point. So from 14 forward, I was do, becoming the best of myself as an athlete and taking my sport super seriously and traveling all over the world. And, and I never took a break. So I think that I started to get to a little point with MMA where I was like, Need, something inside me actually needed a break, uh, and then I tore my ACL. <laughs> so oh, that's where we are presently. Um, and this amount of time off has allowed me to re-fall in love with even just working out. Yes. So I, I couldn't work out for you know, two months straight, and then we get I started doing PT, and it's still not real workouts. And then there was a PT workout, physical therapy workout, I don't know, maybe like a month and a half ago, where it was hard again, and I was actually doing something hard that was – that point of stimulus where it's enough to engage me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I forgot. I, I like this. I like working out hard. <laughs> and um, because I think there was a point I was getting to where I was like, man, I don't really want to go to practice. This is <laughs> hard. I want to learn. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, kind of, I wasn't one foot in, one foot out, but my mind was. My mind was mm -hmm. like, do you really even want to do this? Like, do you want to just be a social media influencer? Go do, like, what? Do you, I don't know. <laughs> and um, this injury has given me the time and the space away from competitive sport where I'm, I'm just always reaching I've all for since I was a little girl I'm always reaching trying to make the most of myself and uh, I couldn't do that during this time period I had to sit down and sit my ass down and 
you know, just reflect and and it's given me that space to for that that spark to light again inside of myself. And so now, um, now that I'm back, actually, I'm able to hit pads just starting this week and shadow box and it, there's a, a new light for this sport inside of me. Wow, that's exciting. Uh, yeah. With that reset, have you set your sights on any, you know, big goals? I mean, you're obviously someone that shoots for the best, but what, what's your what, what's your strategy moving forward coming out of the rehab, obviously getting healthy and like where do you have your sights set? Yeah, so I'm still amateur. Um, my my b- before this, my goal was to be pro, like basically now to be going pro right now. Um, so once I get back, I can start to compete towards the end of the year. Probably take one or two more amateur fights, turn pro, and then one championship has my weight class. UFC currently does not. Um, my weight class is 105, <clears throat> and I really overall I want would love to become champion in one championship. But I really would love for the UFC to add a 105 division and me be able to compete in my home country and for us fans so that that's my overall plan make my run in one and then convince the ufc to add a 105 i think i think that's a great plan um you know to your point about going and going and training and, and finding yourself in that in that rut um it's so important to be able to have the perspective that you have right now to be able to understand that you do need to have these breaks and you do need to Recreate the game in your mind, you know, because at the end of the day, this is what this is. You know, we're playing a game, a mental game with ourselves when, when it comes to being able to compete at the highest level because, uh, you know, you got to find different ways to motivate yourself and uh, different ways to to, to uh, reorient your goals and to make it exciting for you to, to find something to chase, right? It's all about the chase. The chase is where it's at. It's all about the journey. When you get to the, you're just like, dang, that's all it was. You know, you realize it's all about the chase. So, I love that about uh, where you at right now on your journey, um, and and I will also say I would uh, I would definitely uh, stay at Adam weight because the pool when you start doing good at 105 and you start doing your thing, the pool is going to say you know what I'm good enough where I can cover the weight I can cover the size and fight at a UFC 115 if they haven't made a 105 at that time. But what will happen is you'll just find yourself doing really good, but then you'll find yourself not being able to do your absolute best against the girls who are just, they're just bigger. You know, some of these girls are cutting from 125 down to one to 115 or even, even higher 130. So it's just, it's just make sure you fight at that weight. Now I want to say um, with everything you've, you've done in the sports realm and everything that you've uh, still yet to accomplish, you're such a cerebral person. You, you have like this, great demeanor where you just um have great composure and a great way that you carry yourself and um a a very spiritual person at that as well too um talk about this this uh what you do outside of the sports world for to develop that side of you yeah definitely so um i mean i'm a deeply spiritual person and it's kind of just come to me. I, 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 how do I start this? Plant medicine is a big part of my life. Um, but even before that, I w- was interested in Buddhism. I remember when I was just in high school and just started reading books and trying to get an understanding of what's going on. And then I took my first mushroom trip with a group of friends when I was 18. And then that changed everything, of course. It was, I mean, it was the perfect dose. I didn't take too much. I didn't take too little that it expanded my consciousness, you know, over a course of a few hours. And I came to understand a lot more about myself in the world in those few hours than I had. It almost felt like to my, my whole life to that point. Um, and then I'm one week later, I had my first experience with MDMA. And I would say to that point, I was not a very empathetic person. And I think my family would say the same. <laughs> I was very like logical, um, kind of like cut and dry. And that opened up a degree of empathy within me and, and an understanding of empathy that I didn't have to that point. And I was like, okay, these two experiences back to back changed the direction for me just internally and and what I was seeking to understand about myself from the inside out. Um, And from that point, I guess in the same way that I'm like always trying to make the most of myself on the outside, I began that inner journey of trying to truly understand who I am and my connection to spirit and what even is spirit and do I like believe in God, but I don't usually use the word God and what what is all this? (laughs) Um, So yeah, that part of my life is equal parts as big as the external, the, the, 
my journey with wrestling and fighting, you know, I would say even more, even bigger for me. And developing on that path has been just such a journey and such a joy because it's, I've, I've sat in now 45 ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, and I felt like the first half of those, yeah, it's, been, it's gone. <laughs> it's just been going back and going back. But I, I feel like the first half of those was um, for my own internal stuff and my own internal work yeah. and understanding myself. And then there was a break. And then I feel like this plant called me back, like, okay, now you're going to come to understand me, how to work with me and how to serve others um, mm. and just begin the journey. Cause that's a long, my understanding of to, to probably actually serve ayahuasca, like um, as to other people, it's that's such a long journey, you know, um, shamans go have 500,000 ceremonies more. And I just feel like I have a calling to understand plant medicine more than anything, and then serve in the ways that I'm called to currently, which would be like with the plant tobacco, sacred tobacco from the Amazon is one plant I work with closely um, in the form of rape and ambo. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, those are tobacco-based uh, plant medicines from from the Amazon. And and also I'm doing um, the combo certification right now. Have you guys had Cambo before? No. No, yeah. So Cambo is a tree frog from the Amazon and it's this crazy blend of peptides that isn't found anywhere else in nature. There's actually 70 patents in the U.S. for these peptides individualized because wow. um, they're trying. There's so it does so many different things like antimicrobial, antibiotic. Um, when I was in when I, when I was getting ready for Olympic trials during COVID, I was not going to get vaccinated, but I was like, damn, I am screwed if I get COVID because I'm going to if I test positive, you have to like test clean for COVID, and it, it wasn't going to happen in the. I was like two months out, three months out. So I started to receive Cambo, this tree frog, and um, they use it in the Amazon as a natural vaccine. And I would be around people that had COVID. It happened like at least two times, maybe three times where we were hugging. And then I get a call the next day. I'm so sorry. I, got, I have COVID. And we have Olympic trials coming up, like got tested, didn't get it. Um, and then so I was getting it once a month and then I end up losing Olympic trials and I stopped getting because I didn't care anymore. And I got COVID twice, like back to back, bam, bam. <laughs> so yeah, Man. so I feel like my job now, yeah, is to uh to begin to learn and understand these plant and animal medicines that have a tremendous capacity to heal us. How has how have the the people in your circle, um your whether you people you train with, friends, family, um, or someone you may meet when they hear about your journeys through plant medicine, um, what's their response? You know, cause I'm, I'm my own way through my journeys. And when I go out and about it, it sometimes comes up, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, yeah. but are people, are people seeking, are there more people seeking or very interested in, in your journey as, as you just continue to rise? And then obviously some of that has to be from that first trip when you were 18 to kind of say, whoa, this is what it's at. And, uh, yeah. and one, one more part to add to that, who was it and why were you interested at 18 to get into plant medicine or, or to take psilocybin? Who brought you there and for what intention? Yeah, I guess I'll start there and work backwards. Um, there was a group of four of us. I had a really close friend named Paulina. She's still my friend and she was the closest to this world. She had already done mushrooms before and um, new things I didn't know about the, these plants. And we were we just were close friends and we would talk about different things and like i said at the time i was studying buddhism and um yeah it was just like a cohesive way i think she must have just invited me i don't remember exactly but she must have just said we're going to do a mushrooms this week and you want to come <laughs> and i did want to go uh, so that was my first you know introduction and i think i was just curious that's that's another part of a big part of who i am and especially um when i was younger it's just this this insatiable curiosity to understand everything. <laughs> uh, I think that was difficult for my parents at times because it's just like, why, but why, but why, but why? <laughs> so that was that first mushroom trip. I probably just based in curiosity. I don't think I knew anything about setting intentions at the time. And I don't know if my, my friends really did either. I'm not, I can't remember. Um, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> just how people react to you and your story. If it, if it comes up, because you right. know, it's still being, being researched. It's still something that some people just shut completely off when they hear about plant medicine or, or hallucinations or going into journeys. 100%. Yeah. So my reception publicly has been so overwhelmingly positive. Um, I have a lot of fear around sharing and I like a shyness, but I've 
really feel my calling is to share publicly. So on my Instagram, I've now begun making videos for YouTube, just based on my own experience in harm reduction and plant medicine education. And it's been really positive. People are seeking and they have a lot of questions. Every time I've shared, they've I've only gotten a positive response. So that's been amazing because I was fearful of the opposite, obviously, you know. Um, Family-wise, my 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 mom and sisters are also very open and, like, they've received top aid from me and they're just open to everything. And then my dad is doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> he does not want to hear it. <laughs> so I've had to learn that. And I, I've just really – that's been a good lesson because I've had to learn – discernment over who I share this information with in the first place and, and, and awareness energetically, like, is this person open to receive? Um, and at this point, my, my true understanding of psychedelics is what people will have the questions when they want to know. If they don't want to know, then it's not my place to go start talking, talking to people about things they don't want to know. And I, and I have no interest in doing that, you know? So even um, like with my YouTube videos, I, I still am overcoming this personal resistance and like a fear of being received or perceived in a negative way but at the same time if it was me just getting started on this journey I would want to know the answers to these questions and someone ahead of me that I felt I could trust and so yeah just doing my best to get this information out and and not worry too much about it oh that's what I was going to say it's just that these videos are not to convince anybody to start doing psychedelics or it's quite the opposite like if you feel called then here's some information but I have no interest in you know you know, forcing people or guiding people or convincing people to do plant medicine. Mm. I totally get that. Now, now coming in the sports world, and especially being in a sport as hard as wrestling and as hard as fighting, you got the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. And that brings on a level of depression that is, is can be quite serious and overwhelming at times. Um, with that aspect of it, the, the mental aspect of, of competing, but also just the physical aspect of what um, mushrooms have been able to do from a uh, cognitive standpoint, from a uh, neurological standpoint, how much do you think, or do you think at all, like we should as athletes uh, start implementing some of this, this mushroom a, into our uh, regimen? Yeah, I can speak for myself that it's been so valuable and so powerful um, to be like, I mean, the mushrooms that you guys serve, Umbo, I have some Umbo lion's mane right here. As non-psychoactive mushroom, lion's mane is, has been so crucial, I believe, in just keeping my brain safe in a combat sport and keeping me sharp. And when I don't take it, I notice it. So for me, that's like a, a multivitamin, like the way that we're supposed to take our vitamins, combat athletes should be using lion's mane. Um, psilocybin has been critical for me as well. I remember when I first microdosed in a, in a practice setting, <laughs> um, it was in a wrestling room and I was getting, I don't know what I was getting ready for, but I remember I was wrestling this kid and the day before I did not microdose and, and I'd never microdosed in practice to that point, I don't believe. And this kid was taking me down and I had all these, this emotional attachment to what was happening. Like this, I was like, just negative self-talk. This kid shouldn't be taking me down. I shouldn't be losing in this position. Then it happens again. I shouldn't be losing in this position. I'm losing in the position. I can't, I leave practice. It's a terrible practice. I'm like upset with myself. I'm, oh, I can't do this. I'm not good enough to do this. Da, 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 da. And then the next day I microdosed. I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> and I had the same uh, practice scenario with that kid. And he took me down once. And it was like my brain just computed what happened without all this emotional baggage attached to it. It was like, this happened because of this, get into position. And then he didn't take me down the rest of practice. My coach sat me down after practice and was like, it literally said to me, I don't know what you did today, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> like, you about, I swear. <laughs> I swear. Like, that was one of your best practices. And it's because mushrooms, I mean, they give you this capacity to just be present. And that's what you're seeking in sports. What we're all seeking is the capacity to remain present and, and just execute our skills, right? So yeah. that's one of the ways mushrooms has helped me. And everyone has to, like like like, my, like what I said, everyone has to come do it in their own way, I believe. Um, yeah. But it's, it's conversations like this that help people to understand, like, doing, doing things correctly as well in a, a very intentional way with great reverence for these plants that have the capacity to 
you know, change <laughs> who we are as people and change our path, all these different things, um, microdosing properly, you know, not taking too much, not taking, you know, taking the right amount and having respect for the entire process and oneself. Well, are well, all, talk, talk, talk about that uh, microdosing the right amount. Like what, what is that right amount that you feel would be yeah. that? Uh, yeah, so it's interesting for me, it has, that correct right amount used to be 0.2. And I think so much education is required because each mushroom is different as well. The potency, um, the psilocybin content of the mushrooms that one's working with. So it takes about a week for me to figure out what the strain that I'm working with and then my current tolerance. So I've done, I don't know, a few microdosing cycles at this point over my life and um However, maybe like a few weeks to a few months, those different cycles, but I've become so much more sensitive. My correct dose now is 0.05. Mm. <laughs> and if I take more, and I used to be, you know, four times that 0.2. If I take more than 0.05, I'm uncomfortable. It's gone past the point of being a microdose for me. And I'm no longer having the benefits. I'm having negative effects because I'm like a little bit anxious. And so when I say like a reverence for the process, for ourselves, and for the time it takes to figure that out with the mushrooms, um, and with ourselves, that stuff just take, takes a bit of time and practice. And um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally know what you mean about the whole like uh, watching the dose range because you can go from easily just trying to, you know, be more aware and just kind of step into that that present mindset to having to do the spiritual work, you know, having yeah. to do the spiritual <laughs> lifting where you're just like, Man, I don't. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not in the right environment to be doing spiritual work right now, you know. But you feel it on you, and it's, it is a very uncomfortable position when you're in that situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think having like a proper ritual or routine around microdosing or any plant that we're, we're going to sit down and work with. So, I mean, I've been through it both ways, where I'm just like microdose walking out the door, but now I sit myself down and um, have a brief meditation, a grounding practice where I just get myself aligned and centered. And then a respect to the plant, a thank you, and a prayer and an intention set. And then I receive the microdose. And that also will tell me if I'm even in the right place to microdose that day or if I'm just doing this out of a habit and a routine and I'm wanting to reach for something. Um, yeah, because there's there's been some of both. So there's days where if I ground, I'm like, it's actually not the right day to microdose. And it might be because something later is coming in my day that, like you mm -hmm. said, like I'm not going to be in the place to work with it. <laughs> it's actually just not the day for it. But yeah. it takes that, you know, sitting with yourself first. Yeah, that can be along with most everything. If like just sitting with something, be like, you know, praying over your food, every meal, giving yeah. thank, thanks to this great meal or this moment we have together. And, you know, you can put intention into damn near anything, even things that may be bad for you. If you have the right reason behind it, it won't be as bad as if you're putting, oh, this is bad for me into it. So yes. definitely uh, in, intention setting with the fungi is, is, is huge. I feel as I take, you know, a lot of the Umbo products. I mean, I make sure before bed, taking my replenishing sleep is like, all right, I'm ready to have a good night's sleep and recover. And I feel like they almost are in, in, sentient in a way and they know and they hear and they do that for you. They understand, they take those intentions and, and, and bring them back to you. So it's good you have that sacred part about you where you are starting to realize that everything you can take with intention, put intention into it and, and approach your day that way. 100%. Yeah. And the practice of doing that, just being intentional about everything, I find we, for my belief system, we're co creating this entire reality with what I would consider divine source, the thing that makes everything exist in the first place. But we are equal parts of that co-creation process. So setting these intentions and guiding the direction of our life, besides just, instead of just allowing life to happen to us any which way, um, it's such a powerful practice. And it just, it, I feel like that is what we're doing here. That's what we're up to. We're creating our lives and we can create them any way we want. And being unintentional is a creation process as well. Now, you talked about earlier the fact that, you know, when you were younger, you were always asking, wanting to know the answers, wanting to know the answers. With all your journeys and all your spiritual work that you've done, do you feel like, you know, like got a pretty good basis for some of the answers that you've been dying to know your whole life? It seems like you get a grip and then you lose the grip. And it's yeah. just <laughs> you can't hold it. Yeah. And then the whole answer ends up being just to be joyful, to be present, 
and enjoy your short time on earth. You don't know how long it's going to last. That's part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the biggest yeah. answer, the biggest way that I understand everything currently is that it's all a game and it's our choice to play it to the best of our ability and to really if, have fun doing it. And mm. if we're in a space of joy and fun, ease comes. That's that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be enjoying this lifetime. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, that's like my biggest current answer. And I have this capacity to swing back and forth into like enjoying my life, being present, whatever. And then like the term rat race comes to mind of just like, got to get it done. Got to get it done. I have these yeah. goals. I got to get them done. <laughs> and then I get into this crazy cycle that everything is difficult. There is no flow and everything feels dense again. And I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> and then I start to remember and I start to swing back this way. And usually it's like, I'll, I'll get sick or I'll just get exhausted of my own bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, and it sits me down. And then I start to remember again, like, that's not how this is actually meant to work. Yeah. So you're having fun and you're enjoying your life and you have a state of presence. Everything starts to work again. All those things you were trying to get done, they just end up getting done. So yeah. that's where I'm at. Like, what about you guys? <laughs> no, I, t I totally get it. For me, it's just a, always um, pulling the weeds out of the mental garden and you can get busy and caught up in life enough that you just don't tend to your garden. And before you know it, you got weeds in place that you didn't expect to have. And you get, and that's when it gets hard to uh, root it out and find out what that thing is that's bothering you, that, that's causing you to be a little bit more snappier than usual. So um, it, for me, it's just always about doing the work and, and understanding the fact that um, the destination is to never arise. You know, there is no destination. You always are constantly arriving each moment. And I found out when I take that approach, I, I have a better, um, a better, a better grip on things because um, I've been to that place where I thought that I figured it out and I thought that I've, I've known, but that's not the purpose here. The purpose is, is not to know. And when you think, you know, you find, you get humbled real fast that you don't know anything. So it's always just a place of constant evolution, but just trying to be aware and alert as possible. Right. Yeah, you I said remember. You, yeah. Victoria, you said you said remember. I said I'll like forget and then I'll come back and remember. And I think that's really what a, a big part of it is, is just remembering why we're here, what what life really is about. It's about connections, it's about meeting people, it's about experiencing joy, whatever that may be, joy and working out. You like to work out, that brings you joy. Like I love playing pickleball and going on a bike ride and mm -hmm. having food with friends and watching a movie sometimes, like just to be present enough to understand, like, this is awesome to be able to do this and I'm going to enjoy this. And, and really to know that we are, we really don't have control of yeah. anything except yeah. how we react to situations, traffic, somebody's a asshole in line at the store, your partner may be mad at you or like, however we want to react, is, that's our only choice we have. Yes. So you he can choose to be upset yeah, and, yeah, and try to control okay. things. But you, or you can just like choose choose to be in a good space. Choose to be happy. <laughs> choose to be, you know, mad. Whatever it is, we only have that choice. That's all we can control. And I am constantly doing the work. So, <laughs> but it's that's the beauty of life. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love it. Before we get out of here, Victoria, um, I want to ask you a question, and Jake uh, will ask you when to close out. But uh, I mean. You have the goals that you have for, for MMA where you're in a transition of, you know, first getting healthy, then having a few more fights in amateur and then going professional. But overall, in general, speaking from, you know, now until whenever, like, what are the what are the things, what are the main goals that you want to accomplish, uh, you know, outside of the cage and, and, and the impact that you want to leave uh, outside of the cage in your, in your, in your competitive sports? Yeah, so for me, like I said, I feel a call to to share the information that I have that I've built up over my lifetime um, in regards to plant medicine in a life well lived. So sharing that from my heart on YouTube and, and on Instagram and just really sharing with a community that feels drawn to listen to me um, and also receiving from that community and receiving their feedback and continuing to, to spread the things that we've talked about today, the, that light and these, these messages that probably not going to all have it figured out, but we can figure things out together and 
um, just just continuing to grow um, basically in a public way and, and sharing my path of growth and my journey, which is a, is a challenge for me sometimes in itself because it's like, man, this is hard. I don't keep it private. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like my calling is to um, not keep it private, to to share and to be in community over those lessons and these teachings that I receive, whether it's in plant medicine ceremony or outside of it, just in life, and to be able to share that um, openly and honestly. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, beautiful. We're here to support you on that as you go. You know, that's what this is all about today. Um, I also, uh, my last little bit here for you would be, you mentioned joy. I want to revisit, you know, having joy every day, finding joy. What are some things, just to get a little more personal on, on you, what do you do for that joy? What are some things you enjoy you joy doing? Yeah, what do you enjoy doing every day? <clears throat> or some things. Um, yeah, it honestly starts for me with getting grounded in the morning and a meditation practice that sets the precedence for enjoying my day. I find when I don't do, I do enjoy to meditate and to get grounded and get centered, but I find more than anything, it, it like, it like lays the carpet flat. So I'm not going through my day on a jagged carpet that, you know, I just like a nice flat foundation to begin my day. Um, and from there, what do I enjoy doing? I, I enjoy my sport. I enjoy time with my boyfriend. My boyfriend's here from the UK. Um, my friends, my family, talking to my parents. And, and I enjoy creating stuff, even though it's really hard. <laughs> like It's really, currently really hard for me to share my message on, on YouTube and on camera. Um, I do enjoy the process of that from start to finish, creating something and putting it out into the world. Let me ask you a question. Why, why, uh, why is it so hard? I mean, because you, you're so, I you're so, because I mean, but because listen, because when I'm hearing you right now, like I hear, and when I've always heard you, I've always heard you just spit it in a way, like you spit the facts and you, and you put it in a way that's uniquely your own. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused. <laughs> I would love so. to work this out together, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so confusing to me too. Like I could sit on a podcast when there's a conversation I think it's honestly comes down to reps. I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah. Like I've heard the champ Israel Adesanya say it just comes down to reps on camera. And he's one of the most well-spoken that I think that we have currently. And, and he said the same thing. So, um, but I don't know. There's something that happens when I just sit down in front of a camera. One, it's partly planning <laughs> like this. Yeah. I don't have to plan anything. I didn't have to plan. It's almost worse if I try to plan something or try to think out what I'm going to say. But if, I found from my reps that if I just sit down with no plan, nothing happens. That doesn't work either. <laughs> I think I mm. think you should answer questions because okay. you're really good at answering questions. I think you should take some questions that people want to ask, of what want to ask you, and then you should do a video highlighting that question. Okay. Boom. Okay. Because you, you're you're one amazing thing. to answer questions. <laughs> yeah. One Thank thing you, you don't do. <laughs> what do you say, Jay? Don't change. Your your personality and the authentic you that you are, because that's the that's the true gym. That's the true beauty of what you bring. It's just you awesome. owning it. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's a little bit of a part of it too. Is like um, speaking about plant medicine to a community that I don't know who I'm talking to yet, and I don't know where it's going to land. Is a bit difficult. Like I want to say everything the exact right way, and I don't. Obviously, some of these plants are illegal in places. I'm like, I don't know if I'm supposed to. Say, how am I supposed to say this? Or no one's going to come for me. I think there's a lot of that currently. Yeah. But it's true. Just to continue to be myself, um, and it'll work itself out. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, Victoria. I just want to thank you for your time today. You are absolutely amazing, as I expect you to be. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed hearing your story, and I wish you nothing but love and nothing but the best in the future. And uh, I'm I'm excited for your first fight in the UFC at 105. I'm already going to claim it. I'm going to claim it for you. 105 yeah. UFC champion is going to be Victoria Anthony. Jake, you got anything to close out? Uh, just I'm excited to watch your journey, Victoria. It's been fun to know you already and to watch where you're going. Uh, another thing to just pay attention to and send love to and light and uh, can't wait to see where you take it, girl. You're awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for taking the time. Good to see you both. No problem. And thank you at home for watching Sugar and Snakes Takes for another episode. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace, love, and mushrooms. <laughs>